All right, a uh, couple places I want to start out tonight. It's good to be here tonight. Appreciate everybody being here. Um, Michael, I can always tell when Michael makes it to Kenya because he spends money. And so I know he's there spending money. Unless, of course, he was beat up and our credit card was taken. But other than that, I think he's, I think he's there and he's doing okay. Which somebody stole... And I don't know how they got a hold of it. Sweetie Pie and I personal credit card number. Somebody, somebody took it. We, get to, uh, we went up to see Matthew and up in Iowa. And we check into a hotel. And the, the card that we booked a hotel with, they said, this card, we can't take this card. What? So the next day I found out that like their part of their internet service went out up there. So I thought, well, that's, that's the problem. So then I'm going to use it um, yesterday on something and it's declined again. And I'm going, what's wrong with this credit card? Lisa tells me that somebody stole the number or something like that and was trying to buy 3D printers with it. Over a thousand dollars worth of something. They did it twice, they tried it twice. Credit card company shut it down, they're gonna send us, and that going, that irritates me. If you're that smart, why don't you go to work somewhere? There'd be a company who would love to hire you and pay you well to show them how everybody else cheats on credit cards. Get that job, amen? I don't know. You know, sometimes I check. I haven't done that in a while, but sometimes I kind of wiggle that thing to make sure it's, you know, what, you, what you're thinking it is. Yeah, that irritates me. I don't know why it does, but it does. So anyway, but it's good to be saved. Amen. They can have all my money. They just can't take my salvation away. Amen. A um, couple places I want you to turn to. Where do I want to go first? Hebrews 1. And Hebrews 1. And let's see, where else? We'll start in Hebrews 1. We'll go from there. Uh, we're learning who Jesus is. I'm going to try to do a lot better job than I did last Wednesday night. I think my head's here today. And uh, so, and if it is, I'll probably keep you till 9.30. How's that? That'd be good. And um, when we get into the lesson, I'm going to ask you some questions tonight and see what you come up with. But we're studying who Jesus is. And last Wednesday night, I tried this. I don't think I did so well, so I'm going to try it again tonight. We're going to make the connection between Jesus and the Bible. Jesus and the Bible. So my, my position is Jesus is the Bible. The Bible is Jesus. And if you say something about one, you're saying it about the other. And if you try to detract away from one, you're detracting from the other. And this is not just how I say it is. I think this is how God says it is. I think it is. So that's where we're headed tonight. So we'll start out in Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, and uh, remember uh, Sister Bonnie. Um, Roy called me yesterday. He was pretty, when he, when he called... I, I could tell his voice was excited, and they were uh, loading Bonnie up into the um, uh, ambulance, and they, were, they took her all the way up to St. John's, and at first he thought they, she might have had a stroke, but they've eliminated that, we think, and, but she had a seizure of some kind, and I mean, it scared him, you can imagine that. So when I got up to the ER last night, Bonnie was, I mean, she knew who I was, but they had given her some medicine, so I think it was making her really, really sleepy. So I just let her rest. Uh, John went up there to see her today, 
but we want you to pray for her and lift her up. Pray for Michael. The, uh, the court case for those children is within a few hours from now. It's already nighttime in Kenya, and in fact, they're working on tomorrow morning already, and so I want you to be very, very prayerful about what's going to happen with those children. I'm praying that the judge, now that Michael's there, can say, you know, I'm glad you're here, but we really don't need you because I've already got to throw this case out. I mean, I would be a little irritated, but I will praise God nonetheless. But we don't know what's going to happen. But we have placed those children in the Lord's hand. They're his children. They're his children. And so we are going to trust God to do what is the best because sometimes we don't know what's best. You ever thought that thought before? I have. God's convinced me many times before that what I thought was the best way to do it, God said, Mike, don't you think that I'm smarter than you are? And before I could lie and say, of course, God, I think that God would say, you don't think that I'm smarter than you are. So we're going to trust that God knows what he's doing and that he'll do right by those children. He didn't cause us to love them for nothing. And so just pray for them. Uh, Pray for uh, anybody else tonight hurting, struggling, uh, dealing with issues of life. Uh, This is why we're here gathered together tonight. Let me hear you say amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray dear God that you'd bless uh, this evening's meal. This is food for our soul tonight. And we pray, Lord, as the neighbors, would you rise and give us bread? For we are on a long journey through life. And Father, we don't think we're going to make it. And so we are asking you because, Father, I'm asking you because these people have come here tonight begging bread and I have nothing to give them. So, Father, I pray, God, that you would rise and give us bread, that you would bless your people tonight, that you'd visit with each and every one of us. Father, our faith is being challenged even today and it will continue to be challenged in the very near future, I believe, in such a way that all the phony, fake church members are going to fall away. And Father, I beg you every day to not let me be one of them. Father, I pray to your God that you would guide us into all truth. Thy word is truth. So, Father, open up our minds and our hearts tonight. Be with Sister Bonnie, Brother Roy, and be with all the families, Lord, who are in need tonight. Be with those children in Kenya. Bless Michael as he appears before the judge. Father, the judges are all in your hands. Somebody might think that a judge is in their pocket, but that judge is in your hands. And I pray, dear God, that you would do what's best for those children and for your kingdom's sake, and we trust you in that. And Father, we have people that are hurting, people, Lord, that are struggling. I pray, dear God, that you would help them and bless them tonight. Send help from heaven and open up up our eyes tonight as we study the faithful word that's been committed to us. We ask your blessings now in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Very quickly, Hebrews chapter 1, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners Spank in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom whom he hath appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds. And if you are familiar with Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1 then goes into a lot of detail to describe to really separate Jesus from the rest of the angels or for, and for the, from the rest of the creation for that matter. So it really leaves you with no uncertain idea at all. There's no ambiguity here at all. There's nothing shadowed, nothing secret. There's nothing that's not made clear about uh, Hebrews chapter 1. Jesus is not one of the regular angels. He's above that. He is what God called him his only begotten 
son. He did not call that, he's called the other angels sons of God, but they were created. To his son, he calls him the only begotten of the father. And so uh, Hebrews 1 just lays out that case that Jesus is not just an angel. He is God Almighty himself. But he says that God in, in the old days spoke through the prophets. But now in these last times, God then speaks to us by his son, Jesus Christ. And so we're looking at who Jesus is. And the point I'm making is, and this is what those of us who believe the Bible, we don't have a problem with this. But I then would like to lay this out in such a way as let's say there's people out there who are now the way I used to be on this Bible issue. I didn't believe that any Bible could be perfect. I didn't believe that any Bible could be inerrant. I was told that they all had errors in them. I was told that all the Greek manuscripts were in constant need of correction, that there wasn't any perfect translation. And when we talk about, you know, we use the word King James, and we talk about the King James Bible, and they call us King James only, and all of those things, and I don't mind that, but that's not the real issue. Here, that it's only the King James. The real issue is, can the Bible, can what we call the Word of God in written form, the question is, can it ever be wrong one time? Can it be wrong about anything? Can it be wrong about the creation? Can it be wrong about the flood? Can it be wrong about how tall Goliath was? Can it be wrong about how old Adam was and all the patriarchs? Can it be wrong about the Red Sea? Is there any, can it be, can it be wrongly translated? And that's the issue. Can the Bible be wrong even just one time in one small way? Can the Bible be wrong? Is there a perfect Bible preserved for us in these last days? To me, that's the number one issue. That's the doctrine that we, that we as Bible believers need to both believe and know and be able to know where to get that from in our Bibles. Because when you, I don't know if you've ever gotten into an argument on Facebook. You ever got into it with somebody? On faith or anywhere else for that matter. Well, I believe all the translations. What? Well, okay. Can, would you be able to lay out a case biblically for them and either they'll accept it or they'll get mad and leave the conversation or they'll start calling you names? Let me just tell you this. When they start calling you names, you've won the argument. Especially if you're not calling them names back and you're giving them scripture. Okay, you won right there. They won't admit it, but you've won. So the, the core of the issue is, can the Bible, is, shouldn't the Bible be right in everything that it says? And when we say the word of God, do we both mean Jesus, the son of God, and the Bible as the word of God? Turn to Revelation 19. That's what I have up on the screen. And um, I'm going to go through, touch on some of these things we talked about. I did, I, I asked God last week to bless my worst effort, and sure enough, I gave one. I gave an example of my worst effort. Tonight's a little different. Revelation chapter 19. This is the Word of God. This is what we believe. And so, uh, Revelation 19, 11, And I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse. He that sat upon him was called faithful and what? True. Now, these are names of Christ, but they are also both attributes of Christ. They are his character. So, if you were to ask the question, is, uh, is Jesus God? Well, 1 John, uh, we use this verse in the Romans Road of Salvation. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he, meaning God, is faithful and just. So if God is faithful, Christ is faithful, 
So that would mean Christ and God are both faithful, and I think it means they're, they're one and the same. He is called faithful, and he's called true. Now, when, if we're going to make the connection between Jesus and the Bible, Jesus is always true. God is always true. The Bible says, let God, God is not a man that he should lie. Let God be true and every man a liar. And then Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 17, thy word is truth. So we are, now we're connecting three things. We're connecting God and Jesus and the Bible together. All three of them are true. And if something is called true, can it ever be wrong one time? If you had, let's say that you had a, uh, rose your calculator on your desk. You had a calculator on your desk and Rose sits and she makes the deposits every morning and she adds up bank account figures and everything like that. And it's a great calculator. She loves it. But one time out of eight, it gives her the wrong sums. Would you keep that calculator? And why would you keep a calculator? One time, you say, well, one time out of eight's not bad. So if this calculator is wrong, one time out of every eight times, throw it away because you know there are better ones that never get it wrong. So why would you have a calculator that was wrong one-tenth of the time? You wouldn't. So it's the same way with the Bible. If we call the Bible true, but it's wrong, in your mind it's wrong the way it was translated, or it was wrong the way one copyist who was, had a Greek manuscript and he was going to copy a new copy of it by hand, but he got part of it wrong, would we call that true if it had an error in it? The answer is no. It's either true, which means 100% true, or if it's got a lie in it, then it's not true. If you're going to go pick out lumber for a house, I've seen Sterling do this. Sterling, when he picks boards out, he looks down every single one of those boards. What are you looking for, Sterling? Huh? Seeing if it's true. Seeing if it's straight. If it's straight, if it's not straight, what, what use do you have for it? It's no use, okay? And so he's called faithful and true, meaning... He's never wrong one time. When Jesus said, thy word is truth, what he meant by that was, it's never wrong. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. Not a word of God the word of God. Jesus is the Bible. And the Bible is Jesus. And if Jesus, if the Bible's wrong, then Jesus would be wrong. But if Jesus is never wrong, then the Bible can never be wrong. And uh, verse 14, the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. What is a sword? A picture of in the Bible? The Bible, the word. Uh, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress and the fierceness, the wrath of Almighty God. And hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So what that phrase means is that, that there isn't any other king who is above Jesus. Amen? Would you agree with that? So if there is a king who was above Jesus, then Jesus cannot be king of kings. If there is a Lord above Jesus, then he cannot be Lord of lords. Because he's the one who is in charge of every king and every lord. And, it's, and that's my point. If he's called true, then he can't be wrong one time. And if he's wrong one time, he cannot be called true. Turn to John chapter 1. I mean, these are things that to, to, I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm, I'm teaching this to you in such a way as that you'll be able to take from it. 
you'll be able to take these same verses I'm giving you to somebody that you know. Because you might ask them, uh, you go to church, man, that's great. What Bible do you guys use? Well, we, we use all the Bibles. Can I ask you a question? Do you believe all of those Bibles are right in everything they say? Well, they may say, no, they can't be. You could say then, what if I could show you from the Bible that the Bible itself can never, ever have a mistake in it? What if I could show you that? Would you believe it? Okay, and that, that just may be what somebody needs. Because they've heard this argument, they've heard that argument, they probably have a preacher telling them that none of the Bibles are true, none of the Bibles are right all the time, all the Bibles have mistakes in it, and stay away from the King James. So we're not, and we're not trying to make them King James only. Let's be honest. We're trying to make them Bible believers instead of what they are now, which is Bible doubters. So, John 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, two witnesses now, so far. Revelation 19, John chapter 1. Both of them tell us that Jesus, among other things, is both God and the Word of God. He is the Son of God. He is the Word of God. John 1.1 1, 1 says the same thing. The Word was with God and the Word was God. There is no difference between the Word of God and the Son of God. And when people say, I believe that Bibles can be wrong, they have to stop and think then how that would match then with John 1, 1 or Revelation 19. Can Jesus be wrong? No. Can the Bible be wrong? Yes. Well, then you've got a contradiction. You've got something that the Bible says does not add up because Jesus is both the Word of God and the Son of God, and one is the other, and the other is one. Verse 2, the same was made, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made, and in Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And then verse 14, and the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, and at the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, Full of grace and what? Truth. The Bible is full of truth. So a little game I used to play with my kids. When they would want dad to pour some more Kool-Aid. I would pour it until it got to where it was just about to pop over the top. And then say, now drink it. So it's full then, right? If it's full, can it have something else in it? No. So if something is full of truth, is there room then for it to have an error in it? And the answer is no. These are simple things here. But this is what he's saying. He is full of truth, meaning there is no room for mistakes. And let's be honest, when it comes to your eternal salvation, is there any room for you to be wrong about that? When it comes to whether or not you're going to heaven, is there any room for error concerning your eternal soul? The answer is no. No room for error, no room for a mistake. I don't want to get this one Wrong. I'm wrong about a lot of things in life, but about this one, I don't want to get it wrong. So he's full of grace and truth. So um, what we're going to do here in a little bit is I'm, we're going to we're going to we're going to do something that it was actually uh, I think it was Bradley Crum that uh, did this uh, here one time. 
he uh, and he got it from somebody else. But he he preached a message. And I tell you what, it was about one of the best ones I've ever heard him preach on it. What he did was he compared everything that the Bible said about Jesus with everything that the Bible said about the Bible. And he showed you that Jesus and the Bible were exactly the same thing. So let me give you an example of that. Turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And then hold your place there. John chapter 6 and then 1 John chapter 1. John chapter 6. I like verse 66 because I think it matches. John 666 says this. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. I think that's there on purpose. John 666. Everybody, there's a falling away taking place. And in verse 67, then said Jesus unto the twelve, will you also go away? Verse 68, then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast what? The words of eternal life. So Jesus has the words of eternal life. All right. Now hold that place there. Turn to 1 John 1. 1 John 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. So here's what, I'm, here's what we're going to do tonight. I'm going to show you that the Bible says that Jesus has the words of life. Then I'm going to show you that the Bible says the Bible has the words of life. Both Jesus and the Bible are the same in that they both have the words of life. Does Elvis Presley have the words of life? Does Willie Nelson have the words of life? Does Lady Gaga have the words of life? No. Does Donald Trump have the words of life? No. Does Jesus have the words of life? Does the Bible have the words of life? They're both the same. Elvis and Jesus, not the same. I'll never forget, Warren Bergman and I went, one time went on visitation. And we had somebody visit the church and they gave us their address and wanted us to follow up visit with them. So we took their address, it was over in Crystal City, and we weren't sure if we were in the right place. So we knocked on this guy's apartment door. And the guy opened the door. I'm not making the, I'm not, this is not exaggerating one bit. He had Elvis Presley sideburns. He had his hair cut Elvis Presley style. He had Elvis Presley posters all over the wall. He had an Elvis Presley videotape playing on his TV. And he answered the door. Can I help you? Well, we're looking for John so-and-so. Uh, no, I'm not John. Well, can you tell us where what is, such and such address is? Yeah, that's on the other side of the building. Okay. But we'd like to invite you to church. He said, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and shut the door. And I looked at Warren and I said, it's easy to tell whose God this guy worships. And he did. He was this... You know, I'm sure he was single. I mean, but this guy was just Eda. He worshipped Elvis. That was his God. Okay? So anyway, just, people worship funny things. Elvis Presley's not Jesus Christ. John Lennon's not Jesus Christ. Adolf Hitler's not Jesus Christ. But the Bible is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the Bible. Amen? All right, now... Uh, First, yeah, First John chapter 1, while you're there, that's what I have up on the screen. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. Notice that. Our hands have handled of the word of life. Now here's what some people will tell you. 
when you start talking about a perfect word of God, and you start reading the verses, it says right, right here, the Bible says that the word of God would be perfect. They would say to you what a preacher told me. I believe in Jesus, the living word of God. But then they wouldn't necessarily believe that the Bible is perfect, but I do believe that Jesus is perfect, okay? But in this particular verse here, it actually says that in this case, those words, that word of life that you say you believe in that's perfect, it actually says our hands have handled it. Now, can you tell me a time where you ever held Jesus Christ physically with your hands? You would have to say no if you don't believe that Jesus and the Bible are one and the same. Your hands have handled the word of life. Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And yes, he did not leave us spiritually. His spirit is with us. But his physical form is with us every day in that we have the word of God to hold in our hands, to put in our pockets, to store it on our phone, put it in our backpack or our briefcase or our suitcase, or we can take it wherever we go. We can always go with the word of God. Verse two, for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us. How can I show you my eternal life? I can't if I can't show it to you from the Bible. I can't show you eternal life. I can't take you up in heaven. See, this is what it's going to be. I can't do that. I can show it to you by way of the written word of God. That's how I can do it. And that's what he's saying. And show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. How was it manifested unto me? It was manifested unto me in the form of the Bible. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And by the way, that exact phrase, the word with a capital W, seven times in your King James Bible. Seven times exactly. All right. Now, First John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So you have John 1, 1. First John 5, 7. Revelation 19. You have three witnesses in your Bible. Three different places where Jesus Christ himself is referred to as the written word of God. And the Bible says out of the mouth of two, or at the most three witnesses, let every word be established. So while if I were to, and I had a conversation with a guy I used to go to Bible college with, he was pastoring, I was pastoring, and I knew him to be a, a good guy. He was a good preacher, good conservative, or so I thought. And he and I were talking at Bible camp one year about this Bible issue. And he knew where I was going with what I was going to say to him. And he kept trying to def def deflect off the issue. He kept saying, now Mike, be careful you don't go too far with this issue. Don't go too far with this. And I asked him, Mel, how far is too far? Because if the Bible tells me that the Bible never has a mistake in it, and yet I just asked you, does the Bible have a mistake in it? You said yes. And yet the Bible says it doesn't have a mistake in it. Then who do I believe? Do I believe you? Or do I believe what the Bible says? And the only way to answer that question from me was, be sure you don't go too far with that. 
How can I go too far from the issue of whether or not the Bible can be right or can it ever be wrong? And what he had done, he had already moved over away from the King James, which I knew him years before that. All he ever used to preach out of was a King James. Now he had migrated, 10 years after Bible college, he had migrated to the New King James. And I said, Mel, the New King James has removed the word hell 22 times. He said, that's not true. I said, yes, it is. They replaced hell with something like Sheol or Hades or its equivalent, but they took it out 22 times. You go check me out on this. If you don't believe what I'm telling you is true, you write that down and you go check it out for yourself. Obviously, he and I did not talk much after that conversation. I've not seen him since. I pray for him every now and then. He was where I was at one time. We both went to Bible college. We both heard that same thing. He stayed there. I didn't. Because I just was not going to believe that the Bible had mistakes ever again. Uh, Revelation 20 verse 4. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus Christ or for the witness of Jesus and for what? The word of God. Now, here's something that people don't like to picture. We don't like to talk about it, and yet it's true. There have been, throughout history, people who were killed because they believed the Bible instead of believing the Pope. Am I right? Will there come a time when people will be beheaded because they believe the word of God over what the New World Order religion says, what the beast says, the Pope says, the false prophet, the Antichrist. Will that same thing happen again? And the answer obviously is yes. So for what you believe and your belief that this Bible is right in everything it says, and you will not believe anything else. They will cut your head off for that. By the way, the entire Islamic population will be more than glad to sever the head of anybody who does not go along with Islam. So that thing still applies to this very day. But notice how this verse puts the two together. They were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. So, do you think somebody can believe in Jesus but not believe the word of God? They're together. If you're going to believe one, you must believe the other. And for both, you're going to get your head cut off. Which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. I'd say that's a pretty good trade-off. I'll lose my head, but I'll gain ruling with Christ for a thousand years. Amen? By the way, getting your head off is not too bad. Because I don't think you'll feel it. I don't know. I've never had my head cut off. But I just don't think you'll feel it. So that might be the best way to go anyway. I don't know. I'll let you know if it ever happens to me. All right, so... Here's what we're going to do. And you can help me out with this. If you can think of, of some place in the Bible where it says something about Jesus, and then the Bible says the same thing about the Bible. Okay? See if you can think of something that you know of in the Bible where it says the same thing about both Jesus and the Bible. Both our truth on the left hand side you have what the Bible says about Jesus on the right hand side you have what the Bible says about the Bible John 14 6 Jesus saith unto him I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the Father but by me 
John 1, 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory was of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is true. The Bible is true. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you have heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Psalm 119, 151, thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. So here the Bible says that Jesus is 100% true and was never wrong. And then the Bible says that the Bible is 100% true and is never wrong. So you see how I'm doing this so far. So if at any point you want to interject and say, oh, Pastor Mike, I know one. I know where the Bible says this about Jesus and it says the same thing about the Bible. I'll give you another minute. Both are life. 1 John chapter 5, verse 12. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Colossians 3, 4, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. So Jesus is life. Philippians 2, 16, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. So the Bible says that Jesus is life and in him is life. The Bible says that the Bible is life. So both Jesus and the Bible have the same attributes. They quicken. They give people life. Did you think of another one yet? Fine. I'll give you another one myself. Both are... See, this is the... Truth, the life, and the way. John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Bible, 2 Peter 2, 2 says, And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. The way of truth is the Bible. Because we established a while ago that the Bible's truth. So, let's take these two verses and apply them together. If Jesus is the way, can there be another way to God? Can you be a Buddhist and still go to heaven? Can you be a Muslim and still go to heaven? Can you be a practicing Jew and still go to heaven? No, because only Christ is the way. And he said, no man cometh to the Father but by me. So here's what I'm going to be bold enough to say. If you don't come to God the way the Bible says to come to God, you're not getting to God. Joel Osteen was being interviewed by Oprah. Well, that was a setup. And she's asked, she's given him all these softball questions. And she asked Joel Osteen, Do you believe that Jesus is the only way to God? Yes, I believe that Jesus is the only way to God. But I believe there are many ways to Jesus. So that's how he did it. Of course, Jesus is the only way to God. But you can use many ways to get to Jesus. Like be a Buddhist for Jesus. Or a Muslim for Jesus. Or a atheist for Jesus or whatever.
Those two don't work. So I believe that the inerrant, inspired Word of God is the only way to show us God. Many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Meaning that in every one of these churches that has rejected the doctrine of the inerrancy of the scripture, they will always attack the King James Bible. Who's ever sat in a church service or heard a preacher? You physically heard the preacher attack the King James Bible. Anybody ever heard that done? Emily, you've heard that done. I, your mom told you it was evil? Okay, the Catholic Church. Well, yeah, I have it. Chris Pinto sent this to me. He had a Catholic Bible. He opened it up. It had an article in it. It was a Catholic Bible written for Americans. And it had an article at the beginning of it called The List of Forbidden Books. And the King James Version Bible, by name, was the, at the top of the list. If you're a Roman Catholic, it is forbidden for you to read the King James Version Bible. It was the only English translation mentioned. The only one. Okay? Both are bread. John 6, 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. But then Matthew 4, 4, but he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. One of the things that you learn in Bible college is that we don't have all of the words we don't have all of them some of them got left out some of them weren't copied correctly by a manuscript copyist some of them weren't translated correctly so we don't have all the words job 23 12 neither have i gone back from the commandment of his lips i have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food if you're abandoned on a desert island and you have a choice of things to take. Would you take a boatload of food or a Bible? Bible. Because I'd rather die with a Bible in my hand than have a full belly and starve to death spiritually. Both of them are bread. Both of them are light. John 8, 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but he shall have the light of life. 2 Samuel twenty two twenty nine. 29, For thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. As, uh, John 9, 5, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So that's Jesus. But here it says the Bible, Psalm 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. So compare Psalm 119, 105 with 2 Samuel twenty two twenty nine. 29, For thou art my lamp, O Lord. But then Psalm 119 says, Thy word is the lamp. So which is it? It's both. Proverbs 6, 23, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and the reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Psalm 119, 130, the entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. 2 Peter 1, 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arrive. Now, who is the day star? Jesus. So while we live in this world, since we don't have physical access to the Jesus Christ, we have the same equivalent here with us, and that is His Word. And we will carry this book with us, and it will be our light wherever we go until the day star arrives. Both are light. Both are a fire, for the Lord thy God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, for our God is a consuming fire. Zechariah 2, 5, for I say that the Lord will be under her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. But then the Bible is a fire. Jeremiah 23, 29, is not my word like as a fire. Jeremiah 5, 14, wherefore because this saith the Lord uh, God of hosts, because ye speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire 
and this people would, and it shall devour them. Jeremiah 20, verse 9, Then said I, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in mine heart as a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. They both are a fire. Both are counselors. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The Bible, Proverbs 22, Have not I written to thee excellent things in counsels and knowledge? Psalm 119, verse 24, Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. And I can go on this all day long. Both are the power of God. Christ, the power of God. Luke 9, 43. And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. But then Matthew 22, Jesus answered and said, You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And I could do this for time and time and time again show you the connections the same attributes that god the father has is the same attributes that the son has and the same attributes that the son has the bible has as well both now i'll finish with this one both are incorruptible wherefore he saith also in another psalm thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption that means when Jesus was in that tomb, he did not smell, he did not corrupt, his skin did not turn blank, he did not get oozy, he did not bloat from bacteria. There was nothing about him, though being dead, that corrupted those two days he was in the tomb. Same with the word of God, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. So I want you to consider this. And if you want to talk about this, maybe next Wednesday night we can. Can anybody, anybody, ever attain eternal life if all of the Bibles are corrupt. Can anybody, anywhere, at any time, can anybody ever attain eternal life if every single Bible in the world is corrupt and has mistakes in it? My answer is what God said. No. You cannot be born again except the seed be incorruptible. You can't do it. I'll ask it like this. Can an orange tree produce chestnuts? Can an apple tree produce bananas? Can't do it. So can a corrupted Bible produce incorruptible fruit? No. And that's the way that Jesus said it. It can't do it. Now, if you want to talk about that next Wednesday night, we will. Okay? Because I'll sort of explain to you maybe how God brought me to where I am now, believing what I believe. What I think God is still... I think God's still finding people to believe the Bible, don't you? They're out there. I, I'm, I'm not kidding you. I should have brought it out. I got a letter on my desk. We're going to take prayer requests in a minute. But I got a letter on my desk. I am not kidding you. From a, a, a lady that said that 16 years old, she came out as a proud lesbian. 
and God got a hold of her life and transformed her and changed her, and she is born again by the incorruptible seed of the Word of God, and she knows it. That Bible can change people. Don't you ever give up on people. Amen? Don't you ever give up on people. But it, that Bible has got to be incorrupt. Has to be. Because Jesus is. And they're one and the same.